Is that worked? That's Audrey? great. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, it's great to be here today and just want to welcome everybody on behalf of Steve and myself, who are the co-chairs of the European Association of Palliative Care Social Work Task Force. Um, and obviously Steve's your, our presenter for today. Do you want to put up the next slide? Um, so just for those who are not familiar with the European Association of Palliative Care um, and the task force. So this task force was established in 2009 and really what our aim is to do is to offer leadership to social workers in palliative and end of life care across Europe and to look at the tasks and roles of palliative care social workers and education. So we've completed some projects in the last year which are currently um, under review. So we will hopefully publish those quite soon. And we have uh, a new postgraduate diploma in palliative care social work course starting in 2023, which will be international and available um, for everybody to attend as it will be delivered online. So it's, it's great to see how many people are actually on today's call. So we actually had over 250 people registered from different um, countries across the world. And we're hoping that people will continue to join the call. And in relation to Steve Marshall, your next slide, please. Um, I would just like to do a short um, biography. So Steve is a social worker in the palliative care team at King's College Hospital and is an honorary senior lecturer at King's College London. He combines research and teaching with clinical practice and has a particular interest in supporting children and young people. Steve was a co-PI and lead researcher on a recent Marie Curie funded project which involved interviewing 32 children and young people about their experience of living with a parent with a life-limiting illness. The research has provided the basis of evidence-based guidance for healthcare professionals working with patients with a life-limiting illness who have dependent children. Steve is also a Churchill Fellow and has recently returned from Norway and Sweden, where he explored the concept of children as next of kin. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Steve. And you can explain about where people can put their questions during today's session. I will do. Thank you very much, Audrey, and thank you to EAPC for asking me to come along and um, take this session. Um, as Audrey mentioned, uh, I'll just take you through what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a bit of a background to my particular research that Audrey mentioned, um, and then talk about the research, which was funded by Marie Curie, and then have a session talking about the recommendations for practice. Um, but if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat. And I think um, there, it sounded like there was a Q&A box as well. I, don't, I must admit, I don't understand the difference between those two. Uh, do you, Audrey? It's probably easier if people just stick to the chat and they can just monitor the one because they're that's already it. using it. Oh, yeah, actually, there's a, I see a Q&A at the top, but let, let's just use the chat. Um, and then what will happen is that there's going to be regular breaks where there's an opportunity for questions and Audrey will be looking at the questions. So by all means, um, please put questions in the chat as we go along. So thank you very much. Um, so to start with, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background to the research that I conducted. Um, and just to say, this research is, is, is about children who have a parent with a life limiting illness. So children who have a, a parent whose life expectancy it would be expected to be shorter than would be than would be uh, normal. Um, and in the UK, about five percent of all the deaths we have in, in the United Kingdom, we have about half a million deaths every year. And about five percent of those people that die are actually the parents of children under the age of 18. So that means that every year about 41,000 children in the UK are bereaved of a parent, um, which equates to the class sizes in the United Kingdom are about one child, uh, 30 children per classroom. So that means that really in every classroom in the United Kingdom, there is a child who has experienced the death of a parent. And so we can also expect that there are other children living with um, parents who, who have a life limiting illness. And I know that actually for those of you from, from other countries that those numbers may well be higher. Um, and that some countries that have high incidence of HIV and other um, and not high income countries or have a um, much larger number of um, parents who die. Um, so that was the, the um, numbers. But actually, the other thing that we know is that when a child has a parent die while they're during their childhood, we know, and the data is quite 
it's um, you know it, 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 it's quite rigorous data and it's quite quite difficult reading. We know that that it much you are at much more increased risk of negative outcomes when you're an adult. So you're much, if you if you have a parent who dies while you're a child, you're much more likely to suffer from anxiety or depression. Uh, much more likely to engage in antisocial behaviour. Your, your educational attainment is, is affected by that as well, and you're much less likely to go to university or to, uh, or, or, or to have a higher, higher education. So, um, so combined with the, the fact that one, in, one child in every classroom has a parent die, we also know that, that the, the risks for that child are, are the negative, the risks of negative outcome are quite high. Um, but I, as Audrey said, I, I'm a social worker in, in a palliative care team. I've worked in palliative care for a long time. And I know that actually this is an issue that my colleagues struggle with and that, that I have struggled with myself. And that actually we find it difficult when we have patients who have children and, and, and to know what, what to do and to, to do the right thing. Um, and I just really like this from this particular paper I just really like the way that they phrased it, uh, how the authors have phrased it, saying there is a disparity in what parents desire in order to support their children and what they actually receive from healthcare services. So combined with the fact that 5% of our patients will have children as a, as a palliative care specialist, there's also we know that actually we're not supporting those patients appropriately. And that actually they want more from us or, or, or they want a different support from us. So that was where um, my whole research project came from, because basically I was thinking, right, well, we know that there's a large number of children um, that are affected. Um, we know that they have negative outcomes and we know that the parents um, are not receiving the support. So what would the best support be that we could give them? And I'm very keen that anything that we do is evidence-based. Um, and so I was very keen to actually do a research project where we would actually come up with that evidence. We would actually ask children, what is it that you want when a parent's sick? What would be good, um, what, what would good practice look like? And what I was very keen to do was then use that, um, use that evidence to make some recommendations for, for healthcare professionals like myself. Um, so what we did was we started with a systematic review. So looking at what was already written about this subject, what other evidence was there out there? Um, and so with some colleagues from, from King's, I undertook a systematic review and it was published in 2021. And I think Joanne is gonna pop the link to the paper in the chat. Um, it's freely accessible on the palliative medicine website. You don't have to subscribe to palliative medicine. Um, and what we found, these are the, I'll take you through the findings from the review really, really quickly, is that um, there was actually only 18 studies um, that had been published where children had been asked about their experience of having a, a, a sick parent. So, I mean, out of all the papers in the, you know, and all of the, the research, we found that there were only actually 18 studies um, and those 18 studies had been translated into 21 um, papers that were published. Um, what we found from, from those 18 studies was that um, although the children had the experience of a, of a sick parent having a parent with a life-limiting illness, they actually still wanted to have agency. They wanted to be involved. They wanted to be involved with their parent when, when they were sick and actually have an active role, but actually that they were excluded from that by the parents and by the other adults in their life. So actually, although the children wanted to be involved, the parents felt that they actually shouldn't be involved. Um, unsurprisingly, having, having a sick parent is, is very emotionally demanding and, and um, you know, sadness is something that comes up a lot in the literature. Um, but actually, the other thing was that the children were actually involved in a lot of caring for these parents as well, that actually they were young carers. Um, and actually, one of the findings from, from this review was actually children are, are more involved in caring than their parents realise. Um, um, but actually, and you know, central to my work has actually been this concept of agency, and that from the review we found that these children weren't passive, and that actually they, they had active strategies to be involved when a parent is unwell. So I think 
Um, so that's a real quick summary through through the paper. Um, I think, yes, we're actually on to the first break for any questions. So Audrey, is there anything in the chat? No, not at the minute, yeah. No. Do you have any questions? No, yourself, Audrey, you don't have any questions. No, no, not at all. It's all very clear. It's all really interesting, Steve. Okay, thank you. Um, so shall I just um shall I just go on? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay. Oh sorry, here we've got a question. Oh good. Um what is the age gap, 16 to 18? Sorry, I don't quite follow the question. Could you say that again, Audrey? What is the age gap? Is it 16 to 18? The age gap. When you talk about the children. What age are the children? Oh, sorry. So under 18. So children, the definition of children we, we follow in Britain uh, and in the um, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children is that children are defined as being anybody under the age of 18. Great, thank you. Does that, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Seems to. Okay, shall I, shall I carry on? Yes, go ahead, Steve, oh, thanks. Thanks, Audrey. Okay, so, let's, so now what I'd like to do is actually just take some time to actually tell you about the research study that I was involved in. Um, and just to say, we were very grateful that Marie Curie, which is a, a big charity in the United Kingdom, uh, they have a really um, robust re research program, um, excuse me, and they were kind enough to actually fund this research. Um, and I think, I'm trying to think of the, excuse me, the day, I think we originally got the funding in 2018. So um, heck, that's nearly five years ago. Um, and I undertook the, the research with some colleagues from King's. Um, Professor Harding is the head of the uh, Cecily Saunders Institute where I work uh, and two other colleagues who had experience of qualitative research. Um, but I would like to say a big thank you to Marie Curie to funding the research because without them we wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, so we really had, uh, in terms of the research, had really clear aims and objectives. I was really keen that we were going to ask children and young people about what it's like living with a parent with a life-limiting illness um, and then obtaining data from children and young people um, and using that data as evidence to base recommendations for healthcare professionals. So really clear aims and objectives. In terms of data collection, we were able to, we decided that the best way of actually finding out what children um, what their experience is like when a parent's ill was to actually do uh, qualitative interviews. So we developed uh, semi-structured interviews with children and we took the age range of six to 17. Um, the reason for up to 17 is because that's the definition of, of um, a child in the United Kingdom. But the reason we, we didn't want to interview children under the age of six because um, the literature tells us that children's concept of death and dying is really not established until around about the age of six um, and that actually prior to the age of six children can their understanding of the finality of death has not really developed so we felt it wouldn't be appropriate to interview any younger children um, and also we know that by the age of six all children are at school so they we, we felt that they would then have the experience to be able to um, engage in that interview. Um, we took a really broad range, uh, broad definition of, of life limiting illness. Um, we didn't just interview uh, children whose parents were known to palliative care, we broadened it out beyond that. Um, so we, we ex included um, medical conditions from which we would consider them not to be a cure and which the person would be expected to die prematurely, but um, so, so we, I think on my next slide, I'll go into a bit more detail about, about what diseases we, we actually eventually had. Um, we recruited through three clinical teams in, in acute hospitals and 10 hospices helped um, find participants for us. 
we recorded the interviews, they were transcribed, um, and we used thematic analysis to analyze the data. And I did all the interviews myself, um, and then Rachel Fearnley, who was on the, the project with us, she acted as a critical friend. So we were lucky enough to be able to get the interviews transcribed almost immediately after each interview, and then I would send them to Rachel and she would give me feedback to kind of give us that level of object objectivity about that and to, to help improve the future interviews. So we took a purposive approach to sampling. Um, we were going specifically looking for children who had a parent with a life limiting illness who could participate in an interview. Um, and we were lucky enough to actually get 32 children and young people to take part. And I undertook took the interviews between May 2019 and March 2020. And as many of you know, the world changed a lot in March 2020 and I was lucky and we had um I know I know there's a lot of people from internationally on the on this webinar um, but certainly in the UK we had a very strict lockdown because of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020 and I was lucky enough just to get the 30 second interview in in the, the first couple of days of March so the, the study wasn't delayed by the pandemic. We'd originally gone to ethics and asked for um, permission to interview 20 children. And we were so worked so hard at recruiting children to the study, we were actually able to go back to ethics because we achieved that 20 quite quickly. And then I was actually able to look at where the gaps were in terms of the children that we'd interviewed um, with, with the remaining 12. And just completely by accident, we got half and half male and female. Um, we were also really keen to have representation from children from the black, Asian and minority ethnic community. And we were, were fortunate enough to, to have 14 take part. We got the full age range from six right through to 17. And I also traveled across the United Kingdom to, to interview children. So. It wasn't just children who were local. I, I live in London and work in London. We actually interviewed children from, from across the UK. And because of having that really broad definition of parental disease, uh, we had a, a, a range of parental disease represented. So we had parents with um, end-stage renal failure, with heart failure, with cystic fibrosis, um, and only 11 of the 32 parents uh, had a cancer diagnosis. So I'm really proud of it. And I think that really, that, that, that brings a real richness to, to the data because of the, the diversity of the children who took part. Um, <clears throat> so once we'd completed the interviews, uh, Rachel and I conducted a thematic analysis and from the data, we developed five themes. And what I'd like to do now is actually go through those five themes but illustrate them with some quotations from the children and young people. And for me, I feel really strongly that we should always hear from children and young people and we should, we should find ways for them to have a voice. And so this is, is a way of um, enabling those children and young people to, to tell their stories to, to you as participants. So starting with the, the first theme is that concept of agency that I, um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm just going to move my screen so I can actually read this to you guys. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so this young person, Josh, 16 year old said, told me, um, I, I asked them, uh, I said, I'm a healthcare professional. Um, I work with families. As a, as a young person, can you tell me what we could be doing better? What could I be doing better as a healthcare professional? And they said to me, speak with the family and children because obviously we're children and they're like oh yeah you might not understand as much but take that time to sit down and tell them explain what's happening obviously in like childlike words but just take the time to acknowledge that there's kids in the family as well and it's not just all about the fancy words and the adults and in fact that quotation was so resonant um, that we actually used that in the title of, of the publication which i will i will show you um, towards the end of the talk and you'll be able to access. But I think 
what Josh is showing here is that, you know, we as healthcare professionals might be guilty of ignoring children um, and not enabling them to be part of what's going on. And what they're saying here is, you know, just acknowledge that there's kids in their family <laughs> and that actually, you know, it's not just all about the adults as well as the fancy words. But actually, you know, and, and it really made me realise that, in fact, as a, as a professional, like the children know that we're around. They know that their parents go into hospital. They know that their parent might be having treatment or might be going for dialysis or whatever. But they know we're there, but we don't know and are not acknowledging that they're there. So this to me was a real example of some some young person just using their agency, saying, you know, I'm here. I want to be involved. I want to be part of what's going on. So that's the, the first theme. The second theme that we developed from the data is, is trust. Um, and this is um, something that's actually, I'm a big fan of, of um, Ulrika Kreitzberg and her team in Sweden, who've done lots of uh, research with children and, and the need for children to actually be able to trust the healthcare professionals that are looking after their parents. And that was something that came out really profoundly in our data as well. Um, and so this young man uh, called Eagle said, told me, um, I don't really feel down now because I know that my mum has a lot of support at the hospital. When I went with her to do her dialysis one time, I saw like doctors and uh, nurses, they like had a really good relationship and like more like a nice friendship basis relationship. And so I knew that like they would could support her with like for like emotionally and like also medically as well. So. What Eagle's really saying here is that, you know, he, he found that he was feeling quite depressed and was quite worried about mum. But actually, once he'd been to see her in the, in the dialysis unit where she where she was having um, renal replacement therapy, that he, because he saw the relationship she had with the staff, he was able to, to trust them. And he actually didn't feel quite as depressed. And he then also went on to tell me how much better he was doing at school because he wasn't worrying about mum because he actually felt that the team that were looking after his mum, he could trust them to, to, to do right by her. Um, and the concept of trust also comes out in these quotes as well. And it's not just trust in healthcare professionals, but it's also trust in parents as well. And that the parents will actually um, keep children informed about what's going on so this young woman said um I heard mum talking to someone and after that after that I came downstairs and I remember saying what's going on with dad because I heard this this and this and I want you to be honest about it and so she's saying you know like I, I know something's going on and I think in a lot of the the cases I work in myself often the children are a lot more than the parents um a lot more than the parents um think they do and actually it's good for their relationship if they're able to trust their parents and trust their parents that they will they will keep them informed about what's happening. Um, but it's actually more than just like the children need, needing to know everything. And you see this in this quote from Harry, this young man who said, I think I know enough to be comfortable. I think if I knew, if I knew too much, I'd worry a bit too much. And then that would put me in like a really worried state every day. So he's saying, yes, I want to be involved. Yes, I want to have information, but I want to have some control over it. I want to have some agency over how much information you're, you're giving to me. So, because I don't want to be overwhelmed by that. Um, and then finally, the, the final quote on the theme of trust is that this just from this young man who was seven said, um, sometimes, so he's, he's talking about his dad and when his dad being in hospital, and he says, sometimes when I'm not there, it makes me sad. I feel like they won't help him make him better and he's kind of expressing that um he feels that the team looking after dad are not making dad better because at his age at age seven he thought that the, the role of doctors and nurses was to actually um make people better and he he didn't know about dad's limited um prognosis so um because of that he he then wasn't able to trust us as a healthcare team so the, the third theme that we developed from, from the data and from the interviews is, is the theme of caring or, or being a young carer. Um, and I'll just let uh, Timmy, who is a, a nine-year-old I interviewed, explain. And he's talking about um, his mum being ill and he says, 
and, and the care that he has to provide for her. And he says, because it's like a duty, because you've got to look after them, because you've got to make sure that they're okay. Because if, if they've just come out of hospital, you get wary when you're left alone with them, because especially if you've been left alone with them before, you don't know what to do. So I think there's a lot, there's really a lot in that quote. Um, and the thing that really resonated for me was how much children felt they had a responsibility to look after their parent when they were ill. They, they felt it was being a duty, and Timmy uses the word duty here. And um, that really kind of took me by surprise that children would think, just take for granted that actually that's part of my role. Um, and then you hear it from, from Olaf here, who was age 12, um, and they say, when you're with the person, you're still put under a lot of pressure to be like careful. And if you need anything, you have to kind of be on guard all the time, like in case anything happens. So you see this sense of them, them constantly being aware that they have a responsibility towards their parents. And I, I was really quite taken by that. And um, one of the questions that I would always ask um, the participants was, do you feel like you are a young carer? Um, and, and I was really quite taken by the response. Was, um, so we, we, we hear this Morgan here, age 14, said, um, I have to do much more. I don't really go out as much. I'm not as bad in school. I look after my little brother sometimes and do more cleaning. So they're telling me about the caring that they do since their mother had become more and more unwell. And then when I <laughs> said, to, said to them, so do you feel like you're a young carer? Um, they responded by saying, that would be me but I won't class myself as one. And I think um, the issue is that we would consider that person to be a young carer. However, excuse me, they don't define themselves as a young carer and they don't see themselves as a carer. They saw carers as being paid professionals that would come into the home to look after mum or dad. Um, but actually they just felt that the caring that they did the tasks that they did around the home which is part of their duties as, as a child of, of a sick parent um, but that sense of caring that also extended to the well parent as well and we see here in this um, quote from Tobias he says the same way I care for my dad now I kind of care for my mum so in fact he's not just looking after the sick parent he also felt that he had a duty to be good and, and be good at school to, um, to look after mum as well so the fourth theme that came out of, of the data was this need uh, that children and young people have to, to have some normality in their life. And um, this really resonated. There's a um, colleague of mine called Denise Sheehan, who's written a lot on this subject in, in America. Um, and she has a whole concept of children needing a uh, Two, two worlds, uh, a normal world where they are just a child and a young person and they go to school and then a sick world at home and they have a need to, to keep those two worlds apart. Um, and, I, and I am quite a fan of Denise's work. And also what she's developed from, from that concept of two worlds is that as, as the parent becomes more and more unwell, that sick world um, impacts on the, the, the normal world, so to speak. Um, and, and the, child, the child can't keep those two worlds as separate. And this was something that really seemed to come out in our data as well. Um, we see this young man called Harry here, and he's, he's just talking about, I asked him whether or not his, his friends knew about his dad. And he said, I don't see the point in my friends needing to know what's going on in my personal life. And, you know, he just expresses that division that he needs as a, as a young person between his, his dad's sickness and his need to just have a normal, and I, just, I don't always like using the word normal, but to, to just have a uh, have time in his day when he's just a 14 year old who goes and plays football with his mates, you know, and it's not about having a sick parent, he just needs to be that, that normal 14 year old at some point in the day. Um, I asked um, all of the young people at the end of the interviews, I'd say, you know, if you were to meet another young person who is uh, another child or young person who's in the same situation as you, um, what advice would you give them? And Katie says, um, have as much time with your friends as you can, just doing things that make you happy, make you laugh, because that's what you need. Because when you come home and reality hits, 
it's good to do stuff out of the house because when you're in the house that's when you're there you feel like you've got everything to do when you're out of the house enjoy even if it's just going to school it's better than nothing so again this need that, that children and young people have is to have some normality during their day um, and I think that's something we can do as healthcare professionals working, working with these families and encourage families to make sure that children do have that that time out and that normality during their day um, and then the, the final theme which is not unsurprising and it was a theme that came out in our systematic review was that um, was that when you have a parent who's ill children feel a huge amount of sadness and they worry um, and those words sadness and worry permeated all of the interviews even in the younger children um, and I think that the, the, the young person who really sort of summed it up really eloquently was Sammy who was age 10 um, and Sammy said that um, he referred to, to when something bad happens to dad like like you kind of get that thing where it's like it's like a wave it's like some kind of wave where it just keeps building and keeps building and then he says it washes over you I don't think about it and then something finally hits and I get shocked by it and it's not nice but there's not much that you can do about it you can do against it and he's just talking about the sadness it, it, you know you just have this image of for him the sadness just suddenly engulfs him it knocks him over in the same way as a, as a wave would when you're at the when you're at the seaside so um you know I think that just is really powerful and just to remember uh you know that that these children are you know are gonna have huge feelings of sadness about what's going on and you know they might be words that that we can use with them and, and use words that we can use with their parents to help them start to communicate about what's happening um and then the final quote is from katie again um and um she when i asked her you know what what advice would you give to someone else um she very eloquently says take a bit of time just to do something that you enjoy make sure that you're not spending all your time worrying and and that you know there is a danger these children and young people that they are spending all their time worrying and i think we need to really be aware of that and to think about ways that we can support families to to um ensure that children are not worrying all the time um so i think yes we're having a break from my <laughs> from my voice well you'll be glad to know that you're not going to get much of a break at all steve because we've got lots of questions for you oh we um, have got some questions this time Great. we do have lots of questions uh, actually first one's from me actually was how long did each interview last was there an average duration or yeah i'd have to go back to the i'd have to go back to my paper but i think the average was about 30 minutes i think yeah. what you find with um certainly younger children they're not able to sustain an interview for a long period of time and so i think the, the shortest interview was around about 20 minutes um and then to, through to the older child to, to the older end of the of the range and, and the, the 16 and 17 year olds i think the longest interview was about an hour okay um, thank you and um, sarah I was, has I was, asked having, where sorry, did you... just, oh. go on, sorry i was just going to say having done qualitative interviews before i was a bit anxious when they were so short and then i realized actually it's about the quality within them it's not about the length of the interview um you know a, a, a good 18 18 minute interview is is better than a two-hour one where, where there's nothing said really isn't it absolutely you're right and um, thank you for that steve and sarah wants to know where did you undertake the research interviews was it in the homes of the children and young people yeah so we were we gave them the option of, of having the interviews where they wanted and the majority the majority of families wanted it to happen in the, the family home because they felt that's where the children would be most um you know most comfortable and I was quite happy and it, and it fitted around schools and things like that it was easier for me to go to them but some of them actually we have a uh, we have a Macmillan centre in the hospital I work in um, and so some of the interviews actually happened in the Macmillan centre as well so if a parent was say for example coming to clinic for an outpatient's appointment they'd bring the children and I'd interview the children on the, at the same time um, and a couple of them I think I actually did in school as well after school okay. school gave me a a classroom or a private room brilliant okay and was anybody else present in any of those interviews steve or were the children and young people being interviewed on their own i think of the uh i think about 25 of them were on their own and i was genuinely 
surprised by parents allowing me <laughs> to interview their children separately um and, and you know and, and gave me permission to to interview their children on their own um and then the remainder of the interviews a parent was present so we gave them the option of a parent being present if they wanted to but my ideal was to actually interview the children on their own just because i felt the children would be much more likely to tell me what was uh what was really going on and wouldn't want to have to worry about what they were saying in front of their parent but there were a few parents that didn't feel comfortable about me interviewing their children without them being there and that was totally fine yeah which leads on nicely to the next question Lorraine has asked did you have to gain consent from a legal guardian to interview the younger children yeah so in the UK um, you can consent to take part in research from the age of 16 um, even though you don't fully become an adult. The Mental Capacity Act in the UK says that you can consent to take part in any research from 16. So the 16 and 17 year olds consented themselves. Um, and then all of the other children had to have parental consent first. But then we also um, got consent from the children as well, because just because the parent says that they can take part, I felt it was really important that children should be given the option of saying no and there was a couple of children that the parents did give consent and then the children said they didn't want to take part and that was okay absolutely fine I think it's really really important that children should have that power to not feel that they should take part in research unless they want to mm -hmm, great and that leads in slightly nicely to Dr Daz he wants to know were there any participants who dropped out um from your population of participants or uh, and if so how, what percentage Oh, uh, when you say drop out, so we only did one interview, so. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering then, basically what you're saying is a lot of more children were approached or parents were approached and then you got your sample then. Um, and I know you said originally you had only anticipated interviewing 20 and had to go back for reapproval through ethics then to interview um, the 32, isn't that right? That's right, yeah, yeah. I mean, I genuinely thought when we started the project, I had sleepless nights thinking we were never ever going to recruit any children to the project because I know you know there's a lot of a lot of hoops you have to get through and ethics particularly you know certainly in the UK to to be able to to interview children and I thought you know much as I feel that it's really really important to give children a voice I was worried that parents wouldn't let their children take part but actually um, you know, a lot of the parents I was, I, you know, were really willing for their children to take part and actually encouraged it. And, you know, many of the parents said to me, I think it would be really good for them to be able to tell their story just to someone and, and just get that off their chest without anybody listening, you know. So um, I think sometimes as researchers, we uh, we can be quite sort of, we can gatekeep and we can, uh, um, we can worry about causing harm. But I think it's about as long as children and families can say they don't want to take part then I think we should give them the option of taking part and and, and people were really keen keen to participate. Great um, and Ashlyn has just um, said this is really excellent to have parents with a non-cancer diagnosis as most resources are aimed at people with a cancer diagnosis so it's wonder, wonderful to hear the rich selection of illnesses that were covered as part of that interview. Um, so thank you for that. And Dr. Das also said he's very impre impressed with the, the research and the findings. So I have a few more here, which are more specific about di differences that you may have found or may not. So Marina wanted to know, did you find any differences in the narratives of children from single parents? Oh, um, that I haven't done any secondary analysis from that point of view. There were, and there were children that were single parents, actually. Um, I'm just having I'm just having a think. Um, so tell me the question again, Audrey. So did you find any differences in the narratives or the, the dialogue of children from single parents? No, because also, I mean, that's a really I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head and I would have to go back and have a look at the data. But I think that's a really interesting point, because clearly for those children of, of single parents, when that parent dies, they're going to be, you know, without a parent, aren't they? Mm -hmm. so, absolutely. Absolutely. But um. Yeah, I, that's that's made me think I need to get some funding to go back to the data and have a look at it from that perspective. Absolutely. So, so I'm sorry, I can't I can't answer that question. OK, and Natasha wants to know, did you find any themes that were more prominent by age group? So, for example, did the younger children talk about something different from the older children and vice versa? Um, 
I think the, the ones that were more prominent, I think the older children, the sort of adolescents talked more about the impact in terms of like the care and the, the, the responsibilities that they'd had to have since, since their parent became unwell. Um, and I think in the younger children, um, the themes that were more prevalent, I think were really the sort of the sadness and the worry. Um, uh, and I was quite taken aback by even, you know, one of the six year olds that I interviewed, you know, she talked about how sad she was that mum was ill. And I said to her, what, what do you do with that sadness? And she says, oh, I just keep it to myself um, because I don't want to make anybody else sad. And I just thought, oh, goodness, these children are kind of carrying this really heavy emotion. But, uh, uh, you know, even at six, they're trying to protect others around them. So um, and obviously uh, with the adolescents, the issue of school. And, and being able to attend school and do well at school was much more prevalent as well. Um, and that additional pressure of, of trying to do well at school when you've got a sick parent um, was, was much more prevalent than it was in the, obviously with the younger children. Okay, and you keep leaning into the next, next question very nicely, Steve. So the next one's from Rebecca and she's asking about, did the children talk about external support? So thinking really about support from schools. So were schools supportive or not? Yeah, they did. They did mention that. Um, I think it was a bit of a, a bit of a postcode lottery about whether schools were supportive or not. Um, certainly one young woman I spoke to, she talked about how good school were and how even her, she was, a, she'd been identified as a young carers and her school had a young carers group and she felt her school were really, really supportive. But um, some schools um, but I think the other side of that, and, I, and, and maybe that was something that I maybe should have explored in a bit more depth, was how much the school were aware of what was going on as well. Um, and I think that would obviously play a part because obviously a school are not going to be able to be supportive to a child if they don't necessarily know why that child is behaving badly or why that child, um, you know, isn't doing their homework and that sort of thing. So um, it, it was a bit of a mixed bag, I think, how supportive school was. Great, okay. And were there any differences in the themes um, by culture? I, I don't think so. And again, I would love to go back and do some secondary analysis by uh, through a, a cultural lens, I think would be really helpful. But I, I genuinely think that the, the five themes are across all of the interviews. And I think absolutely, I think children's experience will be very much um, influenced by the beliefs within the family, by the cultural, religious beliefs within the family however I think that the, the, the five themes that that we developed are um, generic to, to all children. Okay um, and were any of the findings a surprise for you or and if so um, what? Yeah I think I was surprised by how much care the children were doing. Um, I was surprised by the fact then that they didn't see themselves as a young carer. Um, I was surprised by how much a sense of responsibility they felt towards their parents and how much of a duty they felt. I think that was probably the biggest thing that they felt that it was a duty to, to look after their parent. I wasn't expecting that. Um, and aside was I hadn't, all of the, the children and young people, I asked them to choose a pseudonym uh, for themselves. Um, and I was surprised by the pseudonyms and we've got a Frankenstein in there and we've got a, uh, an eagle, as you saw. But also I was surprised by they also quite a lot of the young people chose a name that wasn't um, wouldn't be recognised as a gender. So it would be a non-binary name. So that's why when I'm reading the interviews, I try quite hard to use he, they rather than he or she. Is that, and so when you see the quote, you don't know whether I, I said there were 16 boys and 16 girls, but you don't know which is which, but they were very keen to use a name that wouldn't necessarily be associated with a male or a female gender. And I was really quite taken aback by that. Um, what I, I, and I think the other thing was the, the, the level of agency that these, even, even the younger children knew what was going on and wanted to be involved and wanted to play an active role. I think that, that surprised me as well. Yeah, Arlene has replied there saying fascinating. Thank you for that reply. Um, no so somebody has asked, uh, sort of haven't written down the name, was it an open questionnaire to collect the data? Did you cr create the questionnaire yourself or was it one that 
had already been developed. So it, it wasn't a questionnaire, it was, it was um, semi-structured interviews. And so in fact, what I did was from, the, from my own practice, um, but also from Rachel, who was part of the project, she was also a, a social worker in palliative care as well. So we developed the themes of the interviews and we ended up with 12, I wouldn't say questions, but 12 areas that we, we needed to cover. Um, and then also as the interviews went on, we also kept refining those, those themes just to, as things came up. Um, so it was, so there was, I, I used to just have like a, it was like a, a, a template, which I just have out the corner of my eye just to make sure that I covered those 12 themes, but I didn't ask a specific question in the same way every time. Um, but I had to make sure that I covered those, those 12 areas. Um, does, does, okay. that, does that answer the question? Does that yeah, make sense? yeah, it's great. Um, and I think it's Maria, Maria, I can't read my own hand right now. Um, thoughts about children and young people about mean. So did any of the participants um, say that they would be interested in meeting other peers um, of a similar age to share their experiences with? Yes, they did. Um, and um, you know, so I was, we, we had a very, uh, a robust follow-up for families as well. So if any of them uh, brought that up, I would then make sure that their family, we shared information with the family about how that they could, how they could do that in, in a safe way or, or have peers from their local area or put them in touch with their, uh, their local young carers group. But yes, some, some did express that definitely. Okay. Um, okay. And, and, and those that were known to young carers group found them particularly helpful knowing that there were other young people in the same place as them. Mm -hmm. But the other thing they, they liked about being with their peers was the fact that they could almost not talk about having a sick parent, <laughs> that they could just be with other young people who knew exactly what they were going through. And there was kind of this unspoken understanding um, and just being with them. And then they would just watch films or have pizza nights or whatever with them. But actually, they felt they didn't necessarily need to talk about being the child of a sick parent. They just, that the young person understood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, Sarah has asked how many people were involved in the actual study. So not the participants, but their, your research team in terms of development, data analysis. I know you conducted all the interviews yourself and you talked there about your colleagues. So how many of you were actually involved in the study? Yeah, it's a very small study. There was four of us. So, um, and to be honest, uh, it makes me sad because <laughs> it was so... Uh, we didn't have, you know, much as Marie Curie were very generous uh, to support this. It wasn't, there wasn't a lot of money for the research study. So we, we didn't have the, the capacity to, to have a big team. So I was um, full time for about a year and a half working on it. And then Rachel, I think was about half a day a week. And then Professor Harding and Catherine Bristow just gave advice and were involved at sporadic, sporadic moments. So as a core team, there was only four of us. Um, and then we also had um, a project advisory group to support us as well. And I think those of you that have done any research, uh, and particularly in qualitative research, you'll often have a group of advisors to, to help you. They're not funded, but they're not paid for, but actually just help move the project along. They're there if you, you need any advice, they help with dissemination. Um, and I'm trying to think, I think we probably had 12 people on the project advisory group. And I think we met four times during the life of the project just to, to move it on. I think we met a couple of times quite early on to really formulate the research and then once sort of midway and then once again at the end. Great. And you always again lead into the next question. So Carmen wants to know how will you use or disseminate your research in the future? Will you use it, um, you know, for education? Are you probably going to talk about this um, next? But you know, who will you be sharing it with, and what are your plans? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to do talks anywhere <laughs> with anyone. Um, Marie Curie are very keen to see that they get they get value for money, and and you know, like Audrey, I I started this as a you know, I was a, a I'm a social worker in in palliative care, and I always feel that you know, any research that I do has to have some clinical implications and you know it comes this research comes from my own experience and therefore I wanted to do the research to then change my own practice but then also to support colleagues to change their practice as well um, so I've done lots of talks um, 
uh, we've got uh, a publication app, which I will show you in a sec. And then we've also got a, a guide for healthcare professionals that's like an easy how-to guide for, for professionals who perhaps feel don't feel that they're that skilled with this area. Um, yeah. So yeah, gonna, and that leads me back. I'm, gonna to go into, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that now because yeah, yeah, because you're going to come up. But um, Lorraine had made a comment earlier on which I didn't say, which fits nicely here now, and that is just the fact that some adults have advised that they don't want any conversations with their children, while others do. So you've talked about development of you know the how to etc for the professionals, but is there something maybe for parents as well in the in the pipeline or? how professionals can encourage parents maybe based on these findings to have conversations or allow conversations with their children? Yeah, absolutely. So, we, so we, one of the things I'll show you in a sec is our top tips guide, and that's a guide for healthcare professionals to, if they're faced, say, for example, a doctor faced with a, a parent in clinic, this might be a guide for how they could bring this subject up. And it actually goes into some of the, the language perhaps that they could use when having that conversation, but also the language that the parent could then use when they go back um, we haven't got any plans to develop anything for parents now but I think that's something for the future and something that I would like to I would like to develop great and um, Jonathan has put a question in the chat there did the financial impact following death get mentioned much as a concern uh, no because none of the all of the interviews happened before the death Mm -hmm. um, so but did they talk about anticipating a financial loss as or impact as chi as children and young people? Um, I think a couple of them did, and I think one one young man in particular was worried because they the family lived in a property that belonged to the school that the parent taught at, and mm -hmm. and was aware that actually when 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 mum died that would mean that they you know there was likely that they would have to move on, but it wasn't a big it wasn't a big feature at all. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Well, that's. I think that I've, answered, I've asked you all the questions, and um, based on what's come through. So, do you want to move on? I just said it was really, really good question. So, thank you. You clearly were paying attention as well. So, thank you for that. <laughs> Shall I go on? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Doke. So, so thank you, thank you, everyone, and thank you for those questions. Um, what I'd like to do is just spend a few moments just talking about how we then have taken that data um, from the study and have developed in some recommendations for healthcare professionals dealing with this issue. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we have a publication out and I think Joanne is going to pop um, the link to the publication into the chat. So thanks, Joanne. Um, it's freely accessible. It's open access on the palliative medicine website and was published earlier this year and as you can see from the title I pinched um, that quote from from the young person so um, um, you know th that will be familiar to you um, and then what we in in that paper so in in here um, there's a box within the within the publication that summarizes our five recommendations and we very simply just took the five themes um, from the interviews with the children, young people, and made them into five really simple recommendations for healthcare professionals. Um, and I'll just quickly run through those. Just so, um, if you're a healthcare professional, you're faced with a, a a parent in your clinic, or if you're seeing them in the hospital, or or even if you're seeing them in the community, it it might be helpful to just acknowledge. Um, that, that, your, that the patient's children will want to make an active contribution and be involved to some degree. It, it, you know, it, it may well be something that you could bring up. You might also mention that children are carers um, and that actually the children might be doing more caring and, and being more involved in, in caring tasks than, than they realise and that actually children want to be involved and they want to help care and they feel it's a duty to do that. So that might be another recommendation that you as a professional could incorporate into your practice. You might want to bring up the concept of trust and that children need to have confidence in, in the professionals looking after their parent. Um, and there may well be ways, simple ways that, that healthcare teams can actually um, involve children and, and, and help children to, to have confidence in them. Um, 
It's really important as well to reinforce that children do need to have some normality in their lives. And that actually, you know, it's okay for children to, to have that play date when a parent's ill. It, if the children want to carry on going to school, it's really important for them to carry on doing that. It's important that they have some respite from the situation at home and from that, the emotional intensity at home. Um, and then also, and this is something I use in my practice quite, quite a lot now, and you know, I get asked by parents, um, how do I start that conversation with children? I know that I need to have that conversation with my children what might be the best way of going about it and I now because of this research will say try the word sadness and worry and see how you get on why not just ask your children is there anything you are worried about are you feeling sad about anything and see where that leads you and it's not you then necessarily needing to tell them exactly everything that's going on to start with it's just very much beginning those conversations and the other thing we have um, in the team I'm in, I'm in, we have a small library of books for children that we can give to parents to actually work with their children. And there are a few really good resources that use the word sadness somewhere in the title of the book. There's a one called The Huge Bag of Worries. And so often I will give that to parents and say, this might be how you start to have that conversation with your children. And I, I like the fact that it actually comes from the data that, that, that you know, it's not just me saying that those are the words. These are the words that the children and young people have used to me. So those are the five recommendations. And, and, and they're in a very academic uh, peer-reviewed journal like Palliative Medicine. Um, but what we felt was that actually to get that message out there, it would be really good to have a resource that was perhaps more accessible to professionals who don't necessarily read journal articles all the time or may well not have the time to read a journal article excuse me i'm just going to have some water and so we developed this resource and we did it in partnership with a team from Ulster ulster university who are also doing a similar piece of research at the same time um, and this resource is freely available on the Marie Curie website, you can download it as a PDF and print it off. You can follow the QR code. Um, and the, this resource is very much just from, from our data, 10 tips to help healthcare professionals who, who are, might find this issue challenging. And I'm not gonna go through all of the tips, but I'm just gonna discuss um, three of them just to kind of give you a flavor of, of what the, the uh, resource is like. So the first tip, to, to healthcare professionals is just acknowledge that this is a difficult conversation. And I think sometimes that can just be really, really helpful with parents. Um, just saying, I find it difficult too. This is something we all find challenging and it kind of almost gives the parents permission to, to know how difficult it is. But also what we were really keen to do in the guide is actually just give, um, give the healthcare professionals just some words uh, to use. And so there's a quote here, it may be best if you tell the children about your illness soon, they'll probably know something is wrong and it would be better if they hear it from you. So it's just giving, you know, for those healthcare professionals who really find this issue challenging, it just gives them some ways of actually uh, making it just a bit easier for them to approach it. Because I certainly know from colleagues and I know from, from collaborations with colleagues that sometimes they just avoid the issue of children because they just find it too challenging and this sort of tip can actually just be helpful for them to just feel that bit more confident to actually bring up the subject of children. Tip number three is prepare question parents for difficult questions and I think it just gives um, some words that parents might be able to respond to, and this is intended for a, a healthcare professional to use with a patient who's got young children. Um, and it might be well that they can just, um, they can just use some of these words. Um, you know, and it, it's just got, you know, that really, really difficult question that I think <clears throat> many, many parents in this situation would fear is being asked by their children, are you going to die? Um, and this just gives like a really helpful way have how a parent could actually respond to that uh, which is the the fourth question down and the the other tip uh, that I just wanted to just explore in a bit more detail is tip number seven is encourage parents not to give false hope to their children it's something I worry about and I think it's something I felt guilty of is that we 
try and stay optimistic and jollify everything and actually is that really helpful um and i think this is something that's just come directly from the data um and the, you know there's a, a quote a way a healthcare professional could could deal with that here it says i know we want to remain hopeful but it's important that your children know the truth about what's happening and that that really <laughs> it comes directly from that quote from connie if you remember earlier on where the, the young woman said i came downstairs and i said to mum i know something's happening i want you to be truthful about what's happening so these tips are very much a result of the interviews that we did with the children and young people oh we've got to the final <laughs> the final slide there uh audrey i wasn't quite expecting that i thought there was was more i think one of the things that i did also just want to mention and that's why there is a picture here um and this picture is by Edvard Munch, who is most famous for, for his painting of the Scream. I think it's probably one of the most famous paintings in the world. And he um, was a Norwegian painter who did many of his paintings that are around um, sickness and death and also around mental health as well. And um, this particular painting is called Death in the Sick Room. Um, and it um, hangs, there's, there's a few versions of it, but the, the most famous version hangs in the National Gallery in Oslo and I think this this picture I was lucky enough as part of my Churchill fellowship to be able to go to to Norway and Sweden earlier this year um, and was able to actually see the original of this this picture and I think this just really resonates for me because this in the picture the chair somebody and, we're, and they're not never really sure who that is it's possibly Monk's sister is clearly dying um, but the the, the family nobody's communicating nobody's supporting anybody there's just complete separation between them and i think that just really resonates with me because we see this in the work that we do but the other thing that really resonated for me when seeing this picture is that there's no children in the frame at all um and just to <coughs> tell you a little bit <coughs> excuse me excuse me just to tell you a little bit about i, I was lucky enough to to get a churchill fellowship to go to Norway and Sweden earlier this year and do some research and the reason I went to those countries is because they have actually legislated for this cohort of children and actually children who have a sick parent in those countries actually have rights now and have had since 2010 um, and that includes children who have a parent with a mental health illness or with a substance abuse problem but also children who have parents with a serious illness um, healthcare professionals such as us have a duty to to work on um, and engage those children and to offer them information and support and so I went to to those countries to see how they actually do that in practice and I think they are compared to the United Kingdom way way ahead of, of us in terms of how much that they support and engage children when a parent's sick and they have a real both of those countries have a real philosophy that if you support children during childhood who, who are particularly vulnerable as these children are you're much more likely to have a well and well adapted adult population so they recognize that so um yeah but i won't i won't go into any more detail about that so thank you audrey did you want to see if there's any more questions and um, i've just been checking the chat there steve so no um i think some people were just having difficulty accessing the the link to the documents so rebecca has sorted that out um, and Joanne has confirmed that um, the recording will be made available to everybody. And what do you think is the future? So Sarah wants to know, what do you think is the future of research on this topic? <laughs> um, in, oh, in terms of research, um, I mean, for me, I think I, I'm not sure there's necessarily more I mean, there's always more research to be done, isn't there? But I think for me, I still feel that particularly because I've just come back from Norway and Sweden, I think because I, because I am a practitioner as well, um, it's more about it making change in practice now. For me, I've very much done, I feel, I've done the research, I've asked the children in the United Kingdom. I mean, I know it's not necessarily a representative sample, but it's a sample of children who are going through this. I've asked them about what their needs are and what they would want and done that. And I've been to see how they bring that in 
in, in other countries and how they actually bring that into practice. So I think it's now time for me to actually bring those two things together and actually instigate some changes in practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping to start with the hospital that I work in, but then roll that out uh, to other hospitals, uh, other professionals, and, and, and if I'm lucky enough, on a, on a national scale as well. Yeah, I think that's really important, Steve, because it can be very, um, you know, interesting to continue to do more and more research, because I think whenever you finish one research project, it it's naturally lends itself to another research question. But as you've already said, you know, you would like to have time to go back in and do more sort of sensitive analysis of, you know, responses by, you know, whether it's their, their cultural or their, their background or by age, etc. There's lots of things or differences in terms of their parents, whether they were from a single parent family or not. You know, Absolutely. so you, you're sitting on a lot of rich data that probably needs um, a lot right. more analysis. I, I think so. I think the other thing, though, is that, you know, lucky as I was to have it finished just at the beginning of COVID, the world has changed significantly, hasn't it, since we did these interviews. And I, I don't know for those of you perhaps who work in hospices and work in hospitals like myself, that actually I felt children became even more invisible because of the pandemic. And, you know, the hospital I worked in, we were at one point, the wards were allowing um, one visitor for one hour a day. Uh, well, that was never going to be a child, was it? Because children need to be escorted. escorted. So it, I, I almost... You know, was worried that my research would become obsolete because you know what all the changes that the, the COVID brought in and we still have some restrictions in the hospital I work in now so I think children are, are, are more invisible so I think there's there is further research to be done about what the impact of COVID has had compared to the, the, the children that I spoke to two two three years ago. Yeah that's really interesting I think that's the fear for a lot of people who did research you know before COVID you know, but I agree with you, you know, most hospitals or most um, organisations do have that restriction and it has to be the same person, maybe yeah. in some cases as well. So you can't alternate, alternate you know, who's going to visit. And um, Stephen has asked here, would you foresee this research feeding into any longitudinal studies in terms of the impact of effective or timely supports with regards to moderating or guarding against complicated grief? Goodness. Um... I'm such a qualitative researcher. When you say things like longitudinal studies, I get a bit anxious because I think, what, what, what is that? Is that that's a population-based study? Is that right? A longitudinal so study? So you'll be working with people over time. So you may oh. meet with a group of people, do an intervention, and you know, before the person dies, and then monitor their their grief over time, their grief reaction based on interventions. Gosh, that would be fascinating. I'd love to do that. I mean, I think it would take a lot of planning, but I mean, that would be. That would be amazing. I mean, one of the things I would love to do is go back and interview these children again and say, see how they are now, how they are since COVID, but also to ask them what was the what was the impact of taking part in this research? Because mm -hmm. I think we worry a lot about children taking part, and we you know we worry about the harm that that might cause to children. But I think it would be really good to go back and ask thirty two children what was it like to be part of a study, and and I think that would make for a fascinating research as well. <laughs> I just need to get the funding to do all of these, don't I? I know, and the ethical approval. Um, um, Joy has asked, would it be uh, would be interested in how the research has changed your practice, or has changed you on a practical basis? You know, were and were children were also blamed as carriers of the virus. Um, I, I definitely feel that it has changed my practice in the sense that it's almost given me much more confidence with parents because I feel like I'm actually able to speak for children and say, you know, I interviewed 32 children, this is what they told me. So when a parent tells me that they don't want their children to be involved and they don't want them to know and that their children don't know, don't know anything and that their children are fine and their children are not worried and their children are not sad, I'm able to go back and say, well, look, I completely respect that you know your children better than anyone, but I have a strong suspicion based on the research that I did that that's not the case and you know just to get parents to kind of think differently and I feel it's just given me that much more um, just much more confidence really. Mm -hmm. And hopefully people being here today and hearing you talk about your research and having access to your papers it will give them the confidence to know that this was these were the findings from research albeit conducted in the UK. Absolutely you know and I think they're probably 
certainly transferable to, to other countries and obviously may well need adaptations depending on the values in that country and the, the, the beliefs of that country. But I think, I think there's something generic about what children want when a parent's sick that, that goes beyond culture and nationality um, and, and religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope, and that, that's the whole point for me was to give all healthcare professionals much more confidence with this issue. And it certainly mm -hmm. made me more confident and I hope it makes other people more confident too. And also you've mentioned, you know, about the rights of the child, you know, and how in um, Norway and Sweden have addressed this with legislation, but, you know, we do need to think about the rights of the child to have information and to be informed of what's going on, don't we? Totally, you know, and I'm a big, I mean, Audrey, you know that I'm a big advocate for the rights of children and I'm a big fan of the UN Convention and I feel like we could be doing more around that, but I do feel that we feel we're protecting children often and in fact we're not protecting them we're denying them their basic rights aren't we mm -hmm. um, you know in article three it's article 12 isn't it that says you know children have the right to be involved in matters that affect them you know it's very clear i can't think of a matter affecting a child more than the death of a parent but i think we <laughs> we don't involve children as much as we should yeah uh, and, and I think we are de we are denying them their fundamental human rights. Mm -hmm. That's another research study on its own, isn't it? Yeah. So um, we've got another question. If we change practice and implement some interventions to assist parents and children to talk about the illness or impending death, the change will be the challenge will be to evaluate the interventions. Any thoughts or any ideas about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we haven't. You know, we haven't developed an intervention as such, um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And I th think that's something that I'd quite like to do, perhaps on a hospital basis, is, is if we can get professionals uh, and support professionals across the, the hospital in different, not just in palliative care, but in different different fields to actually talk about children in clinics and things and then see how what an impact that then has. It, 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 yeah, that's something I'd, I'd like to do. I think it's it's tricky isn't it to, to be able to compare the I'm just yeah just thinking off the top of my head about having the study where could you do one where where the intervention was used in one clinic and not in another I suppose that's a way of doing it isn't it yeah that's your randomized control trials where you have the intervention versus um, usual yeah. care yeah yeah I mean, you can might, see might... yeah would... okay so Natasha's yeah. made a comment here about she's also be wondering about that do not necessarily complicated grief, but the impact on the need for bereavement support, you know, so if you have good effective support delivered prior to the death, does it um, minimise the need for support after the death has occurred? Yeah, I mean, that would be that would be great to be able to prove that. My belief is that, yes, and this is what this comes from, is that if we can support children better at the time of the parent being ill and at the time of the child, uh, at the time of the parent's death, we would hope that therefore the, the complicated grief would, would be minimised or, or reduced in, in those children. It, again, we'd need to do a comparative study, wouldn't we, um, to mm -hmm. see whether that was the case. Um, yeah, I think and there's so many that, different variables at play as well, aren't there? Yeah, I think that's perhaps one where, um, I, I mean, in the Scandinavian countries, uh, uh, they've got some big population based studies because of the way that they collect their demographic data and uh, over time. And I think that might be one where it might be able to actually do a population based study looking at something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's yes, why we. Sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> and so that's why we know that children are much more likely to to experience anxiety and depression is from some studies that have been done in Denmark with adults and they're able to 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 work out that those adults who who experienced the death of a parent in childhood and then they look at their admissions to hospital and their their um their use of um, antidepressants and the, the data is really quite sad you know quite robust that actually you're much more likely to experience anxiety and depression if you have a parent who dies in childhood mm -hmm. um, i just wonder whether we could use that same sort of population-based data in, in the sort of thing you're describing Yes, and Jonathan um, has come back in and said um, he agrees. We'd love to see more research on potentially mitigating bereavement outcomes due to effective support prior to death. And I know that's something I'm often asked by um, Marie Curie. Do we have the research for that yet? You know, so I don't think we do have enough research to say we can mitigate it completely. But 
or how many sessions would somebody require to mitigate need and bereavement support? So that's an ongoing issue. Um, Carolina has asked, where can I find more information on your research um, on as children, on children as next of kin? Yeah, so um, I haven't published anything yet. Um, I, um, I'm a Churchill Fellow and the Churchill Fellowship has a has a website and when I will be doing a report from my study and it will be submitted to the fellowship by the end of the year and then once that's been a peer reviewed it will be on their website so you'll be able to see it on there and then I'm hoping once that's been approved I'm hoping to adapt it into a, a, a journal article. Brilliant. Um, and Arlene has said that Alison Penny, who I know you know well, um, and her team have a good assessment and review tool at Childhood Bereavement Network. It's a clinical tool and has other possibilities. Are you familiar with that? I know Alison well, and I, I did a talk for the Child Bereavement Network a few weeks ago, but I don't know that tool at all. I mean, if you have a link to it, please, please do share it in the chat. Yeah, so if Arlene's listening, if you could... Um do that but yeah it seems to be a lot of people saying it would be great to have you know more studies looking at um interventions before a death occurs and trying to see um what benefit that has yeah so everybody's familiar with the child bereavement network um but not all oh, right so, so it's ac accessible by their membership section so that's oh. the difficulty I'll ask Alison um, about it next time I see her. Yeah, so basically feedback coming from people saying very good points, really interesting, um, very timely as well. So I'm not sure if there are any more questions. I think I've covered everything that's come through the chat. Okay, well, we're good for time because I think jo, Joanne wants some time at the end as well, doesn't she? Yeah. Um, I mean, just to also say my email is on the, the slide um, that's up at the moment. I'm really happy to be contacted by anybody about this issue. It's a it's an issue that I feel really passionately about and I spend a lot of my time thinking about. And, um, you know, if anybody wants any advice or, or has any suggestions or knows of anything that might might help me and my work, I'd be really keen to, to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think actually was it the first slide I had put up um, of their two names for EAPC, just in case there's anybody who's interested in keeping in contact with us and to find out what we're doing in EAPC. Because do, you want, do you want me to go back to the first If you slide? have, because I think oh, both our email addresses are on that one. Um, that would be great, Steve, thank you. Ah, yes. So if I do... Yeah. Um... There we go. Yeah, so just if anybody's interested in finding out more about um, the Social Work Task Force or the work that we're doing um, or the postgraduate course that was mentioned for palliative care social workers. I know not everybody on the call today is from social work um, or if they know any colleagues, that would be great. And likewise, linking in with us about future research, we're always looking to see what we're going to do for our next um, plan. Aren't we planning ahead, Steve, for the next 12 months? Um, and it's it's good to sort of think about some of the topics that might come out of this and to know other people who are interested. So if you're interested, in maybe getting involved um, in any future research with us or have any research ideas that you think the task force should look at, please get in touch. It would be great to um, hear from you. Mm 